being grateful spills over on other people. And if we lose sight of that, it's really easy to go into what you talked about early, which was the victim. We're either victims or we're players. And I think one of the best ways to be a player in life is to just be grateful and to pass it on to somebody else. Hello, and welcome to episode number seven of the Living and Leading with Emotional Intelligence podcast. I'm your host, Brittany Nicole. Get ready to be inspired and get real with life and business. In this episode, we're going to be speaking with Gary Fry about the ups and downs that life brings and how important gratitude is, especially when we're facing difficult times where it may be hard to find something to be grateful for. So Gary and I were introduced probably a year ago by a good friend, Jeff Weiner, who is the CEO of Pair PEO. So if you are a small to medium sized business and you're looking for that perfect match for an HR service, highly recommend checking Jeff out. He's awesome. I'm so grateful that Jeff introduced me to Gary because Gary, the first time I met him at a local coffee shop, I felt like I had known him for years. He just has this genuine personality. He's super transparent about the struggles that he faced in life and business, hoping that others can learn from that experience. And he has a genuine desire and eagerness to help others. Gary is currently with BGW, which stands for Balance, Growth, and Wisdom. It's a CPA firm, and he calls himself a connector, MacGyver, and confidant. Gary is also the co-host of an amazing podcast. It's called Anything But Typical. I would highly recommend checking that out. Gary co-hosts that with Ben McDonald. Um, And while this episode does talk about business, it talks about life because they're one and the same. Our life flows into our business. Our business flows into our life. So regardless if you're a CEO, a stay-at-home mom, a college student, I think that you will gain a lot out of this conversation with Gary. So without further ado, here's Gary Fry. Thank you for taking the time to meet with me today. Of course. It's, it's been a while since we've seen each other. So and we had coffee at not just uh, no, central coffee. Yeah. Yeah. And then we, we were at a few events together, yep. but yep. yeah, I, I'm halfway through listening to the uh, podcast with Stacy. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I love her. What I didn't know is she's also from Kansas. I'm like, Quinter, I've been to Quinter. I've been to that Dairy Queen. <laughs> so. Oh, that was you. I couldn't tell who was saying that. Yeah, um, that was me. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah well, and Chris great. Elmore is one of the funniest people I have ever met in my life. Like, he just, <laughs> he's so funny. I love your podcast. Like, you've got some really great content on that. Thank you. So. Yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun. Um, you know, people have great stories. Yeah. Everybody is unique. Well, Just even your story. I mean, that, and that's kind of why, why I wanted to bring you on today. And I mean, I'll let you tell what you want to tell, but. Sure. Whatever. You know, whenever we met, you were just so transparent with your life and things that, you know, happened and how you got into the positions that you're in today, but a lot of tough lessons learned mm-hmm. and, that I think that's what distinguishes okay leaders, like mediocre leaders from great leaders, is their humility and transparency. Mm-hmm. Because without that, not only can they not grow as a person, but people trying to emulate them and grow really can't develop without knowing that full story, right? Because that's true. There's that false sense of, oh, you just made it straight to the top without any issues. Um, yeah, that's very true. So I appreciate that. It only makes it worse, I think, because um, I think it was actually Casey Crawford who said this, which I think is just powerful. And he probably got from somebody else too. But basically he said, don't compare your behind the scenes reel with somebody's show reel. Mm-hmm. The problem is, is we all know our behind the scenes reel, but not everybody's willing to share that. So you see the Instagram, hey, everything's great. Yeah and you know life is great and I'm on my jet and actually it's not your jet and whatever you know exactly exactly (laughs) so I'm gonna let you introduce yourself I'm gonna do a separate introduction for you 
um, just based on how I know you. So I'm going to do cool. that film separately, but usually I just ask people to introduce themselves. Cool. So yeah, go for it. Tell so, us about uh, yourself. Hey, Brittany and everybody else that, you know, all three of you that are watching this or whatever. Uh, my name is Gary Fry and um, I'm 58 years old and my background is an I planned and God laughed background. I started as a graphic designer early in my career, got drug into a turnaround situation when I was 28. I had no credentials to do it. We turned it in about nine months. And since then, I've run four companies and I've done two turnarounds and I've been in two Fortune 500 companies and one of them was in a MacGyver role. So that's why if you see my LinkedIn profile, you'll see Connector and MacGyver as two of my descriptors. Um, and um, I have been married for almost 37 years, believe it or not. I've got two grown kids and three grandsons that are just tons of fun that I've been teaching how to boogie board. And, um, and then I do business development for a CPA firm that only does work for privately held businesses. Um, and I coach CEOs of companies that are wanting to scale and be aggressive about intentional growth in their companies. So um, I don't fit in any, anybody's box. And if somebody tries to put me in a box, I usually break it anyway. So <laughs> That's a little bit about me. Awesome. I love the human side that you bring to business. And I think, I mean, I, I think everybody in Charlotte that I've spoken with knows you. You're just one of those people that everybody knows. Um, but it's not necessarily for what you're doing as your title, but for who you are as a leader and a person. And I kind of like we were talking earlier, got to know a little bit more about you over coffee. And again, not many people are that transparent. And mm. I appreciate that. And I think that's what other people appreciate about you is because you're authentic and you're genuine. And you know that in order to help other people grow, that you have to be vulnerable yourself because that helps them appreciate all of the hurdles in life that they're going to face and not feel bad whenever they misstep or take a few steps back because now they know if he can do it, I can do it because this is a normal process, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I agree. With my business, so I started a business called Catalyst for Change probably three years ago. Um, and it started with personal development for myself because I came from this place of a lot of anxiety and really suppressing some emotions and blaming everyone else around me. Mm. And I didn't realize how it was affecting my life in all areas, my relationships, my schooling, my, my work ethic, all of that, because I was playing the victim. I was projecting my emotions onto other people. And when I went to school for psychology and I realized like, I have control of my emotions, not the situation, but my emotions, which is even more powerful in my opinion. I yeah. started to apply that in my life and I did a 180. So when I went into corporate, I started to see these managers that were micromanaging and leading by fear. And, mm -hmm. you know, but then I saw them as a person in pain instead of a person who is just, you know, I didn't demonize them. Like a lot of people just say, that's just a miserable human being. Now that's a person in pain that doesn't know how to process and deal with their emotions. So being someone who helps other leaders and business owners develop their business and themselves, um, how do you do that? And what was your journey for yourself in coming to terms with, you know, being that humble leader? I know that's a mouthful of a question, but <laughs> yeah. And if I miss uh, something in that, then you just rein me back in and, and clarify or hit me again. Um, you know, I, there are people that think leadership is about command and control. And, um, and I may have been there early on in my career too, quite frankly, you know, and I was, um, I was always extremely perfectionistic um, 
I got into advertising, believe it or not, even though advertising really presents, in many cases, a false reality. Oh, well, this is how it should be. So I always would subscribe to, oh, well, this is how it should be. And so I became a problem solver based on how it should be. <clears throat> and I'm actually pretty good at that. Uh, a friend of mine said he's a heat-seeking missile for solving problems. And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of me too. Um, because I see stuff that's broken and I want to fix it. But the problem for me was I actually ran over people that got in my way because I was extremely focused. This is what I'm building, you know, and as long as you're in, you know, one accord with me, we're cool. If not, I'm going to run right over you. And I would have never consciously thought that's what I was doing, but that's exactly what I was doing. Um, and had I succeeded in everything that I was setting my mind to do, because I, I wasn't given much, you know, as a kid in the middle of Kansas, coming from a very blue collar family, you know, uh, my dad was an entrepreneur on the side because he was an educator and he needed <laughs> another income. And my mom was a nurse, right? So, and I wasn't given a lot and that's okay. I was taught hard work, but one of the things that's interesting, I remember I had a coach when I was 17 years old, I was so bummed because my best friend had just meddled at state and I failed to medal and we were on the same relay team, but I had worked my butt off and he was screwing around the entire year. He was a senior mm -hmm. year. And I was so upset because I had like, I quit drinking pop even. I didn't, you know, I, I oh, well. miss a workout for any day. Like I was super regimented and I still didn't qualify individually. And my boss or my, my uh, coach said, Gary, there are two things you can control, your attitude and your effort. That's it. Well, fast forward, I had to get kicked in the teeth a few times in business and in life, I think, in general, to realize, because I was really trying to control a lot of stuff, you know, and, and, and fear would, would drive me. Fear was, had, a, had way too much of a control on me. Um, and each time I would go through a really crushing thing, I'd be like, oh, God, you know, get me through this. But then when you come out on the other side, each one seemed like it was a, a prelude to prepare me for a meth, uh, something that was going to be more difficult. Yeah. And then when you see other people, when I saw other people and the tragedies that they went through, I realized, holy moly, when you get to know people and their story, Everybody has pain. Everybody. And it was really, the light really came on when I was in private equity in Ohio. We had 300 ultra high net worth families around the country. And part of my job was the connecting rod between them. But I, you had to be invited into this group. And so learning their stories um, and, and the, the, the story that was interesting is you had to have high integrity, low ego, and a willingness to help somebody with no strings. That was besides the financial hurdles and all that. And, and you had to have P&L responsibility in your, in, in your walk. And I, I was invited in. I was the least of all of them by far in 04. And then I sold my company and, and rolled it into that company in 05. But when I got to hear these stories of mountain men, I, I, these, these were like pinnacle career people that owned major league baseball teams and that were extremely wealthy men and women. And I was captivated as I got to hear their stories. I heard their pain. I knew the tragedies that they had gone through. And the thing that blew my mind the most was their humility. And I'm like, that is what I want to be. That is what I want to emulate. And I remember coming back from one that the family had inherited $330 million. $330 million. That's, that's just a little bit of money, just a chunk and of change. What was amazing is when I came back and I heard more of their stories and some of the challenges that happened and how they made some mistakes of, you know, massively changing their lifestyle and which unintended consequence created entitlement zones for friends or alienation zones. Um, I came back 
after spending some time with them in their city, I flew back and I said, honey, I wouldn't trade them. And these are, these are beautiful people, but man, the stuff that they deal with, like I wouldn't want it. And, um, and so those were the things that really hit me. And then in 09, when we got just filleted uh, financially, our, our firm blew up. 30 million bucks worth of us got torched and, and wiped out. Wow. And um, the guy that I thought was one of my closest friends, we found out he was a complete fraud. I was asked by the board to help clean this mess up. And his 11 offices shut down, 90 people gone. I mean, it was just investigations, all kinds of horrific things. That was, that was probably the lowest I've ever experienced in my life. I had two kids in college at the time. And I remember thinking how intentional I had to be on being grateful in the midst of really terrifying circumstances. Besides just losing the money, there was just a lot that was going on. And I was just terrified uh, frequently. And it really came down to surrender and serving somebody else. You know, being mindful and being grateful for what I had. And comparison is the opposite of that it kills it like you know i've said many times since then man can comparison kills gratitude and it really does and it doesn't mean that we have to be thankful for the circumstance because many circumstances are just terrible but we can find gratitude in the midst of those things and i think those are the things that when we can help as leaders and I don't think, you know, it's just, let's just talk about as human beings. Because <laughs> yeah. you know, at the end of the day, whether we're leaders or we're followers, we're just human beings. And we need those connections because the human condition is not that different from person to person. We make, we make it seem like it is different. And, you know, my former industry of advertising and now it's social media that makes it seem like, oh, well, this is how it is supposed to be. Mm, peel back the onion and look back at behind the curtain and really see what's there. So let's, let's pick up there because what you said about how things are supposed to be, how things are supposed to appear. I think that is the biggest problem nowadays and why we can't genuinely connect because from a young age, we've been taught, this is what you should do. This is how you should respond to this situation and so we're on autopilot. We're running these yeah. social scripts that we've been taught. And then whenever something becomes extremely stressful and overbearing, that breaks because that takes part of the rational brain, right? So then emotions kick in and we fly off the handle and we say these things and you can really see the true disconnect there when things fall apart because nothing is nothing is uh, genuine. It's very surface level. Yeah. And I see that in organizations, you know, they'll like organizations want to bring me in to speak about communication and employee engagement and leadership. And they want me to do a workshop and I'm like, okay, so what outcome are you looking for? Well, we really need to change this problem and that problem. It's like, that's not going to happen from a workshop. Like I'm happy to come in and take your money if that's what you want to <laughs> do, but the workshop should be the very beginning. It should be an introduction to something greater for something that's more long-term. Um, and I call it putting new paint on a rusty car, right? It may look good for a little bit, but that rust is going to come through the surface eventually. Yeah. And I think we do that not just in organizations, but in our society, be polite, have manners, but then we just turn around and talk about that person, that very thing to someone else Yeah. because we don't have that genuine um, connection to people. And I'm sure you see that like everywhere. Yeah. I mean, you know, the reality is we live in a fallen world. It's beautiful, but it's broken. And um, you don't learn resilience and you don't learn humility from a workshop. <laughs> no. They you can't, you can't teach it. Yeah. Um, but when you see it modeled. Yes. Um, that's the key. I think that's the deal. You know, um, 
I had an uncle who actually became my pastor. And he was the one of all my mom's siblings, you know, there is a farm family. He was the one that was on his way to being a millionaire because he was well known internationally for his championship Suffolk sheep. He was a, he was a master at that. Well, he, he leaves all of that and he self funds a church that has everything from street people to doctors in it. And it's a small little church in the middle of nowhere in Kansas. But I, what I learned from him, and I used to show some of his sheep <laughs> as a kid, um, but he would say, you know, sheep are dumb, you know, but they need to be cared for. And if you drive the sheep from behind, you will get some, um, you'll, you'll get capitulation. But if you really want them to follow you, you lead from the front and you, 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 they know that they, that you, they are loved by you and you're not asking them to go somewhere that you're not willing to go yourself. And I thought, man, the simplicity of that message and a lot of people I've seen in corporate America. And again, I think I've been guilty of this. Well, you drive for success, you drive for results and you drive people. Well, at the end of the day, it really is driving by fear and not modeling by love. When exactly. people know that they are actually loved and it doesn't mean that you got to be best friends. I mean, I've got people that I've worked with that I really don't want to spend time with outside of work, but it doesn't mean that I can't love them and that, that I can't show respect for them. We may yeah. not have a lot of other things in common and I may have to speak hard truths, but if, if they know that I genuinely care about them and I'm not trying to sabotage them, it's a lot easier to take that. And, and, and I'm speaking from my standpoint, I don't like being corrected either. Nope. I, it's just not fun to feel like, Oh gosh, I fell short. But if somebody corrects me and I know that I'm not going to just get cast to the curb, I know that they, they truly do care about me and they have my best interest in mind it's easier to take. And then I really want to run through brick walls. And, you know, the best boss I ever, ever had, Helen Eggers, Nations Bank, Bank of America. She's still there. She's not on LinkedIn. Don't, you won't find her. <laughs> She's no one of the most her. powerful women still at the bank, extremely well regarded. And she still is the best boss. And she modeled that for me. She modeled it for me. And so I'll, I'll be eternally grateful for her. And, um, you know, if I could be a fraction of the kind of leader that she was to me, that I could do that for somebody else, I'll say that that was a good, good move. There's so many people who want to be mentors to other people because um, they like the idea of someone looking up to them, but <laughs> they kind of fabricate that, right? It's like, look what I've done. Look what I've accomplished. You know what I mean? There's a difference, totally. right? Uh, and that's what I love about Stacy Cassio. Me too. Because not only did she found the Pink Mentor Network, but she is a true mentor. I mean, yeah. I jump on the calls. I try my best if I don't have a, a conflict for meetings to jump on every month. And it blows. I mean, she's got a lot of people, you know, that are members of the Pink Mentor Network. Pink I'm just going to say P and M yeah. uh, or P M N, but yes. every meeting she will call people out and talk about their accomplishments. And I'm like, how do you remember all this? How do you know this? Cause she has a genuine interest in these women, like a yeah. genuine interest. And I think that's what's needed is not the mentor that is, First off, a mentor is not someone that talks about themselves the whole time. A mentor is someone that listens, can see themselves in you, and then ask, how can I help you? Would this advice help you? It's more they're asking you questions, not telling you about their life and their accomplishments. And I think that's where so many people get it wrong, right? Yeah, I totally agree. It's funny that you mentioned Stacy because, as you know, um, she's our current... Uh, episode uh guest on yeah. <laughs> the anything but typical podcast 
And when I called her, because I didn't know her, but um, another woman that I met said, oh gosh, you need to meet Stacy." So we had this call and we just hit it off. And I said, I would love to have you on this podcast. And she said, well, only if I can get Chris Elmore. Well, I know Chris Elmore and I'm like, well, <laughs> I don't think he, he's ever worn pink. <laughs> and I've never seen pink bows in that crazy long ZZ Top beard of his. But what was so really cool, like, I'm like, all right, cool. Even so, she's got the Pink Mentor Network, which is really designed for women. And yet she honors this dude, Chris Elmore. And one of the things that's most powerful from that hour and 18 minute podcast or whatever it is, um, is just this notion of it is a free flow of exchange of ideas. And um, it's not a, I'm up here and you're down here, junior. And someday you might be able to be, Mm -hmm. no, that's not it at all. You go into it. Somebody had the courage to ask for help and humility and that was willing to kind of go out there and then the person that they're seeking them out like in this case it was chris said saw something and said yeah and it wasn't this oh you're on the pedestal but they they wanted this peer exchange even though you know chris is like yeah she came for some specific things but he said i get as much from her well that's how life should be i think (laughs) yeah that's the beauty of the human condition. If, if we acknowledge the fact we don't have it all together, mm-hmm. we can still learn. And that was one of the things that blew my mind. So in these, these 300 families, you know, we had CEOs that had been the head of huge petrochemical companies that you would know, or one that had been like, and I'll, I'll use his name cause he's okay with it, but he um, had been the last CEO of American Motors, and then Dollar Thrifty Rent-A-Car as well. His name's Joe Cappy. He wrote a book called The Last American CEO. Actually, right, right back there. Um, he was in his probably 70s when I met him. I think he's in his 80s at this point. Um, but he was still actively engaged in business to help people. Like he, he has some sons in Atlanta, I think, that had car dealerships or something. He was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And it, it just blew my mind that, you know, the, the insatiable curiosity and the, the humility of wanting to learn from others that may not have the same sort of accomplishments, may not have nearly the same sort of wealth, may not have nearly the same sort of education, may be decades younger, but still wanting to learn. Like, there's something really powerful in that. 100%. Yeah. And I try to be mindful because now, and I'm still very new into my business. So I have so much more to learn, but there's stages like Stacy talks about there's stages in mentorship and finding the right mentor for the stage that you're in. Mm. And I have some people coming to me seeking advice. And, you know, sometimes I question myself, like, do I have that to give them at this point? Because I'm still learning. And the last thing I want to do is give them advice that I'm still like trying to get myself. Um, But like you said, we all have something to learn from one another. And at least I can say, this is what I'm doing, but this is what didn't work. But don't take my advice. Take the information I'm giving you giving you and decide for yourself if that's something that you resonate with and then go ask someone else because I can only give you advice from my perspective and my experience. And I think so many people mess up that way by saying, well, this worked for me, so it's going to work for you. And that's, that's not always the case because for me, when I first started, I was doing the stuff that some people told me to do and it just did not work for me. Yeah. Right. So as a mentor and as a mentee, I think that's where we both can learn is realizing as a mentor, this is just my experience and what worked for me. And as a mentee yeah. saying, I need to kind of 
it's, it's like research. The more you pull from all the data, you'll start to find commonalities, but there will always be outliers, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you think about this. I, I remember when we had our first child. Third, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I remember bringing this baby boy home and I'm like, where's the instruction manual? <laughs> right? What the heck are we going to do? And I remember thinking, well, I can't wait at least until you're old enough that you can tell me what's wrong. All, Cause all I'm hearing is crying. I don't know what that means, you know? And I remember having this thought when I was feeling very melancholy about it. And it's like, don't wish his life away enjoy the moment and embrace it the unknown i mean that's what life is right i mean embrace it embrace the moment um you know i real quick story i gotta tell you so um bb and t has a leadership institute that's amazing i mean it, it's truly amazing and i heard about it from a couple friends and one of my friends said his dad went through it when he was at First Union, which is now Wells Fargo. And he said it changed his life. So he said, if you ever get a chance to do that, well, it was like 12,000 bucks to go for a week and oh, wow. have 12 grand. Um, and so a few years ago, one of the people at bb &T got to know me and was telling me about this and, and introduced me to one of the people that was one of the leaders of it. It's in Greensboro. And they had just built this multi- I don't know, 20 or $30 million facility that's in, in the woods. And it's just unbelievable. It's so cool. And they said, Hey, we would love to have you go through that. If, if we had a cancellation last minute, would you be willing to fill the slot? We'll pay for you to do it, but you got to clear your decks. And I'm like, yes, we'll take that chance. Well, sure enough, I got the opportunity to do that. And wow. we're actually the first group that went through this. And it was amazing. I mean, they get into neuroplasticity. They go into all the stuff, you know. That's awesome. They were a seven-year-old self and all that kind of stuff and stuff that I can't talk about because I signed a, an agreement that I wouldn't talk about. It. But here's one of the things, the most powerful thing for me personally, three entries in a gratitude journal every day. And write one thing about what you're grateful for with each one of those things. Like, I'm grateful for, and for me, usually it's like, I am so grateful to be back in Charlotte, North Carolina, after 13 winters in Cleveland, Ohio. No disrespect to Cleveland, Ohio, but the weather beats uh, Ohio all day, every day in Charlotte. <laughs> I can imagine. I can imagine. Um, anyway, it, and... Charlotte's just home to me, even though I was raised in Kansas. Charlotte's just home to me. I'm grateful every day. You know, I, I hear the birds singing. I hear the cicadas chirping out there. And I'm like, I love it. And I, but being grateful spills over on other people. And if we lose sight of that, it's really easy to go into what you talked about early, which was the victim. We're either victims. Yeah. Or, or players and I think one of the best ways to be a player in life is to just be grateful and to pass it on to somebody else it's really um, easy to do but you have to be very mindful about it because we've always got stuff that we don't like we can focus on the stuff that bad stuff that's happened to us or things that we caused or whatever or we can just go you know what I can control two things my attitude in my effort. And one of those things that I can control about my attitude is can I find great gratitude? I love that. I, I absolutely love that. And I tell that to my coaches. I have coaches that financially, they don't have to ask for anything. I mean, anything that they want, they could snap their fingers and have it. But they're like, something's missing. And I'm sure you found that when you were working with those people who you're talking about that are multimillionaires. And working with these individuals myself now, I realize like, I am so grateful and fortunate. I may not have the cars and the house and the things like that, that they have the bank account that they have. But what I have is contentment and fulfillment within myself and the things around me that are non-material. 
like you were talking about with the birds and the cicadas, those simple things. And people, until you get it, until you're, you're there yourself, you don't understand how grateful you can be for those little things. And no matter what happens in life, I can always look at that. Um, There was one point where I thought I had a scare. I thought I had cancer. I didn't, but I, I was experiencing all these health issues. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. And I just knew that I had cancer. Mm -hmm. So when I came to that conclusion, if you want to call it that myself, I started to see the world in so many different colors. Things that normally were dull were not dull anymore. I remember driving to work and just seeing the wind go through the trees and seeing the sun come up. It literally brought me to tears as I was going to work. And I had this appreciation for just the simplest things, like watching a little ant crawl across the sidewalk. I know it sounds crazy, but I, I just had this gratitude for everything because I thought my life was ending. Yeah. And it wasn't, you know, later they were able to find out what was wrong with me. And, you know, it was curable and everything, nothing big, major, but After a while, sadly, that, that awareness of that present moment slowly started to go back to normal. And I would give anything to have that sense of awareness and gratitude again. Um, And I think that is the beauty that comes with people who do have those illnesses because they have the opportunity if they take it to really appreciate life. And it's unfortunate. Sometimes we have to get to that place in our life. Yeah. to be that, that grateful because we can be that way every day if we wanted to. Well, and that's why I, I go back to what was the biggest thing that I got from BBNT Leadership Institute. It was literally, um, and I'm not saying save yourself $12,000 and don't ever go to <laughs> BBNT Leadership Institute. If you can do it, it's an amazing experience, but daily gratitude, whether you put it in, and there's something about writing it in a journal that is really powerful for me. I've got a a fountain pen that was given to me by one of my clients and this cool leather bound, uh, handmade leather journal that I just keep refilling the journal uh, booklets in it. Mm -hmm. But there's something really powerful about that. And, and to your point, you know, when, when we lost everything, um, didn't lose my house, but my wealth was gone. And I had these two kids in college and all these scary things happening. Um, I had to get really intentional about being grateful. I had to will myself into being grateful and find and remember the goodness, remember the things for which I can be grateful and then give thanks for those things. Um, and I'm, I'm glad I'm not in that terribly dark place again, because there were moments where I just didn't want to wake up. I mean, I was not thinking of actively killing myself, but I was honestly disappointed because I thought, well, I had plenty of life insurance and my wife and kids would be taken care of. And I didn't know that I could keep them in college. Um, and um, and they, they found their own ways to be able to do it, which I'm grateful for. But nonetheless, pushing myself into finding gratefulness was really powerful. And I don't think we have to wait until we're, you know, a really dire situation for me. That was the catalyst that pushed me into it. But, um, that discipline, um, I am I'm, I'm better off today because of it. I wouldn't have wished that on that situation on my worst enemy. I honestly wouldn't have. And yeah, there are people that have been through way worse stuff than I've been through. It's not a competition. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we don't get any, any trophies. <laughs> but the human condition is we live in a fallen world and, and um, it ain't as great on the outside as everybody thinks. You know, this one family, they inherited $80 million and I, um, different family. And I went and met with them and they, they, said that their friend's favorite uh, saying of them is, it must suck to be you. Oh, wow. Wow. And they were miserable because of that. 
you know, but there was this comparison because they were all middle class, the same little town. And then all of a sudden they hit the lottery when they discover that they had inherited $80 million. And they thought that the, you know, the, the father who had passed away was a pauper and they, that was not the case. And he didn't even know what he had. <laughs> that was crazy. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, he had original shares of Walmart. <laughs> worth eight wow. <laughs> wow. Insane. And, and he never experienced any of it. I mean, he died a pauper. He never knew what he had. But the, the trauma of just hearing that story of hearing it must suck to be you. I mean, again, comparison kills gratitude. And it was killing on both sides of the, t of the aisle. Yeah. And, and I, I don't know. I mean, what do you think is the solution to getting people? I mean, we know what the solution is, you know, to be more present and to have more compassion for ourselves and for other people and to listen to other people and all of these things like can help our situation, but telling someone that is not going to change yeah. anything, you know? So what do you think is the catalyst for that change? I hate saying this. I mean, I really do. And if there was another way, maybe there, there is a way. I don't know. But a friend of mine during that really ultra dark time of my life, he said, Gary, out of our greatest pain often becomes our greatest ministry to somebody else. And it, it's hard to hear that when you're hurting so deeply but it resonated with me and but i couldn't i, I really couldn't think about well how am i going to help somebody else because i was just trying to survive but i think that's very true another thing is is a friend of mine he had been the treasurer of walmart um he and he, he is one of the most beautiful human beings i know uh he was one of sam walton's pallbearers who started walmart he was an early employee, started working for him, I think, when he was 16. Wow. And he had all these, uh, we call them Randyisms because he had these nuggets of wisdom and just some really cool stories, but very grounded man. And um, we were going through some shaking in the company. It was a, not quite a year before everything blew up, but we were having some um, difficulties and this and that, and we'd be on a a leadership team call and he and he just had enough and he's like you know what I gotta go serve somebody and um like what and he's like I gotta go serve somebody I gotta get my eyes off of me mm. because the pain was so high and there's a lot of wisdom in that one um and it doesn't mean that you completely neglect yourself it doesn't mean that you put bury your head in the sand and say you know, I don't hear it. It's not, it's not there. No, you know, right. it's Stockdale paradox. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with him or not, but he was a highly decorated Navy guy. I think it was a, he, yeah, he was a Naval Admiral and he was, he spent seven years in the Hanoi Hilton. You know, he was tortured as a prisoner of war oh. in Vietnam and he had been in Korea before that. And the Stockdale paradox is basically this. You cannot lose hope but you must aggressively confront your current reality as well. And what, what he saw was optimists that died in the Hanoi Hilton because they, they were optimists, tremendous hope, but they were putting deadlines on when they would be free. Mm. The deadline would come and pass and they would die of a broken heart. Wow. And, and so there, there's tremendous wisdom even in that. It's like, okay, be hopeful and, and um, don't lose sight of your vision, but also confront your current reality in equal measure and understand. And for me, that is like, okay. And a friend of mine had told me, I said, man, why am I so, I felt like I was a raggedy Ann doll in the mouth of a Rottweiler when I was going through this. I would wake up with night terrors. I would wake up with night sweats. My, I'd hit my pulse and it'd be 140 beats a minute at two in the morning, drenched Jeez. sweat, 
And my resting pulse at that time was 39 to 41. Wow. And, um, and I felt like somebody was choking me. I mean, it was just awful. And I said, why am I so, um, why am I so powerless against this fear? I had been fasting. I had all these scriptures about fear. And, and I called two of my friends who had been through fire. And they're both some of the most integrity laden people I've ever known. And they had been through tremendous difficulties. And so I called each one of them. One was in Charlotte, one was in Boise, Idaho. And I said, why am I so powerless? And both of them gave me the same answer a day apart. And this was in August of 2008 or 2009, August, 2009. And they said, Gary, it's about surrender. I'm like, what? And they said, it's about surrender. Can you trust God? And whether you believe in God or not, for me, that was an important thing. Can you trust him even if he doesn't deliver you? Can you trust him even if your worst fears come upon you? Oh, well, that was a, a mindset shift for me because my prayer was, and it was a broken record of these three things. Lord, I know you can deliver me, but will you please deliver me? Repeat. Lord, I know you can deliver me, but will you? Please deliver me. Repeat. It was just like a broken record, always going in my head. And what they said, like, stopped me in my tracks. I had to think literally for 48 hours and go, hmm, can I, can I trust him that deeply? So I had to go back historically. Can I trust you? Do you is there enough historical evidence that you are real? Uh, yes, there actually was. We had just gone through a book by Gary Habermas, and it was on the historical reality of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, which, like, just from a historical uh, history perspective, not even from a faith perspective. Oh, wow, okay. So then I had to go next. Well, if somebody put a gun to my head and said, recant your faith, were there evidences in my life where I knew that I'd have to say, pull the trigger because I cannot refute what I've experienced? And there were, there were, there were some, you know, very defining moments in my life that I could not explain away. So I would have to say, pull the trigger. Well, it was at that moment, because I hated the situation I was in. But what was amazing is like, well, can I trust him, even though I don't feel him, even though I'm terrified, even though it feels like I've lost everything? Can I trust him? What was amazing is it got worse. It kept getting worse until December, but I started sleeping like a baby. I never had another wow. night terror, which is really amazing to me because situationally got worse, but I had peace. And that's where a lot of that gratitude came into play because it wasn't c conditional like the Stockdale paradox. Well, I'll get through this by such and such. I didn't even have confidence I'd get through it, but I, I knew, and my wife had said, Gary, even if, we, even if they take the house, even if it's all gone, it doesn't matter. That still wasn't enough. You know, that I appreciated her stance because we got married with nothing. <laughs> she was 19, I was 21. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, and we didn't get married because we had to, we wanted to, uh, which was cool. But um, that, wasn't, that still wasn't enough. But that surrender for me, so it, somebody coming at it from a non-faith perspective, I, I, I don't know. I, all I can speak to is my own situation, but that was tremendously freeing. Yeah. Uh, and I yeah. still have to draw on that. I mean, life didn't all of a sudden get easy after that pain subsided. There were other challenges along their way. There have been plenty of them still have to go back to the same thing and it's really the simple things man yeah remember and be grateful well for me you know i grew up in a christian family and i hit a point where i'm like mm, i don't i i don't think there's anything because there's just been so much that's happened not just in my life but just going on in the world like i don't believe in that mm. then i started to feel like I, you know, I don't really know. So it was more like agnostic. Mm. And now I'm at the point where I believe when you look at the root of all religions, 
you can find love and understanding. When you really go to the root, not what it's become, not what we have as human beings yeah. have made it, but at the root. And I'm more, you know, universal, right? Like the, I feel like there is something that I don't understand that is beyond my comprehension, whether that is God, whether that is universal intelligence, whatever it may be, right? But going back to what you were saying, surrendering regardless of what you believe and letting life just guide you is so important. And I think that was the wake up call for me as well, because with what's going on with COVID-19, you know, it's impacted some people more than others, right? For my business, all the contracts that I had with people like disappeared. They were like, ah, we're not, we're not bringing you in for training. We don't know what's going to happen with the company. So I lost everything and I'm still in the infancy of my business. I left my yes. full-time job six months, seven months before. So I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? But because I believed in the process and that I can only control what I can control. And that yeah. is working towards my business helping people, creating content that's going to help people, then everything is eventually going to be okay. I don't know when, but it will be. Mm. In my anxiety, like I just did not have anxiety. Wasn't making money. Didn't know when yeah. that money was going to come, but I was content because I was yeah. doing what I knew I could do. And that was all I could at the moment. So, you know, um, I want to piggyback onto that because the, since we moved back to Charlotte five years ago, there were a couple times where um, I got part of a, being uh, a reduction in force. So I got fired, <laughs> me and, and other people that were making too much money, I guess. Uh, and it was really hard because my wife went into surgery uh, a couple days after my last day and they removed a football size mass. We didn't wow. know whether it was cancerous or not. And I didn't have health insurance, all that kind of stuff. Another tough time. <laughs> Gosh, no so, kidding. Um, and I remember, so I had to go back to the things that I had learned in that really dark time. In and then as we started, you know, reluctantly, quite frankly, going back into just full-time coaching and the reluctance was, two things. One is it takes about two years to build a book of business. And I didn't have a two year runway. And the second thing is it's lonely if you're just doing it by yourself. So now Robert Fish brought me in. Um, he provided some relief from the loneliness, but it was, I still had to build my book of business. And so it's, at that point, as my wife recovered and thank God it was not cancerous, um, you know, she had a longer recovery and that sort of thing. But nonetheless, I said, honey, I can't even look at checkbook. So I can't even look at it because the way I looked at it was I was on the high wire walking with no net below me. And all I could, and quite frankly, guess what? Life is that way. We are all walking on a wire with no net. Well, what happens if you got plenty of money? Great, but that isn't gonna save you if you have a health issue. It ain't gonna save you if something bad happens to your kid. It ain't gonna save you if something ha bad happens to your wife or your spouse. We're all walking on a wire without a net, the way I look at it. And so I said, honey, all I gotta do, I can, I can just focus on the next step on the wire. What can you control? Your attitude and your effort, that's it. So for me, it was the next step on the wire. What do I got to do to build this business? What do, and part of it was, I got to just go serve somebody. What? Yeah, I, I just needed to serve somebody. Because um, the pain was still, still there, but I needed to get my eyes off of me. Next step on the wire. And guess what, man? Like, I still don't even know what we have in our checkbook. I'm, I've released that much control. Like, and I was literally, when we were first married, this is embarrassing, but I'll tell you. I went down and I'm like, wait a minute, you bought a Snickers? Seriously, that's not in the budget. I'm not kidding you. I wish wow. that's how tight of a rain wow. I had 
because I felt like it was my responsibility. It's all on my shoulders. We got to make this. And we didn't have anything when we got married. And I just said, if we get in a position where somebody's going to, you know, foreclose on the house or we're going to miss payments, then just let me know. <laughs> but right now I cannot focus on what we got and what we don't have. I just got to focus on the next step on the wire. So I hope that helps somebody out there. Because yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I love the part about service because I think that's what's lacking in our society these days. There's so much focus on the self. Um, you know, look at me and look what I'm doing and look what I have and nobody's really doing anything for other people, sending a tweet or reposting or sharing a cute video or a, you know, compassionate video. That's not helping other people. And to be quite honest with you, when I started at Wells Fargo, they had, um, different positions there. Like, um, you know, you don't get paid for it, but it's like being on the board of diversity and inclusion and sure. doing all these leadership things. And I wanted to work my way up the corporate ladder, quite frankly. And I'm just being transparent. Like sure. I just wanted to get to the top. I felt like I was behind and I was like, what do people do that are great leaders? Well, they do a lot of community service stuff. So I started getting involved in community service, not because I cared about helping people. I could get, right. I dreaded it. Like I, the first few times I canceled events that I was supposed to be at, like the day of, like, ugh, I don't want to go do this. Like, ugh. Um, but then I started forcing myself to go because I'm like, well, if I want to get to the top of that ladder, I got to start doing this stuff. I got to start putting in the hours. I got to get yes. my face out there. I got to be this person. That's awesome. Yes. And so I started to do it, um, not from the goodness in my heart, but for exposure in my resume. But as I started to do these things, I would leave that experience feeling so much joy and appreciation and gratitude. And then I got used to that feeling and then I kept going back. And then I was like, I actually, mm -hmm. then I started to do it because of the joy that it brought to other people, the change that I saw that I was impacting someone else's life. And if people have to start doing it because they want to build their resume, I'm just going to say go for it because I'm hoping, I'm hoping that they have the same experience that I have where it clicks and you're not doing it in a disingenuous way, but it yeah. turns into that. Yeah. And from that, I agree. Like when you're in that spot, there's somebody in a worse spot. And when you help that person and you can bring them up and elevate them, it elevates yourself without even trying, you know, it elevates that spirit and that sense of connection with that person. So I think that's a beautiful takeaway. I'm glad you shared that because, um, you know, it's really hard to discern our own motives and it's really scary sometimes because we, <laughs> and I'll just say, I have thought, oh, well, I, I mean, we can justify freaking almost anything. Oh yeah, 100%. But getting back and getting real about why do I do it? This is why that Simon Sinek golden circle is so powerful and why I think it resonates. You know, it get, gets down to the why. Why are we doing what we're doing? And it's scary to open up that door, but it's extremely freeing when we do. And somebody said, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Mm, that's, right? that's great. And yeah. it's very true. I don't remember who, who first said that. It may have been I, it may have been FDR. I don't remember who it was, but I thought, man, that's really true. And I remember, you know, back in the day, before I hit 40, the business journals 40 under 40 was the coveted place to be. And I got nominated for it. And I'm thinking, oh, gosh, you know, just yes, struck gold. <laughs> it would be so validating. <laughs> yeah. The problem was, I wasn't on any boards. I wasn't on any of that kind of stuff. And it wasn't because I wasn't tempted. And yes, we did stuff at Bank of America and whatever, because, you know, it was expected of us and it was good being good uh, stewards or whatever, community citizens. But for me, I had two kids at home and I worked enough. I was not going to be gone every freaking night. And I did not want my children to wonder well, I guess we're less important than 
these other people that, and my dad got his P, well, he, he, he didn't do his dissertation, so he was just shy of his PhD, but he, he got additional degrees and this and that. And I, I know that he regretted not being there for me as a little kid because he was always at night school or whatever, pioneering a new program. And when he got older, he regretted that a lot. And I, I said, Dad, I appreciate, you know, and we worked together on the weekends. He had lost a leg to polio when he was 17 mm -hmm. so as his helper from the time I was a kid. So I was always his fetch it, fetch it guy, and mm -hmm. Gary, and go get that Gary and whatever. But um, I just remember the regret that he had for so long. And I thought, man, I don't want to do that with my kids. And so why? So I never made it into 40 under 40. <laughs> but so what? Who yeah. cares? I mean, yes, yeah, great. I, I appreciate all the people that have made it through those um, you know, it, that are alumni of the 40 under 40, that's great. But um, we have to know what we stand for and what's important. And, you know, for me, my family was more important than all these other things. And it doesn't mean that there are plenty of 40 under 40 probably that were amazing family people, but I just didn't have enough time in the day given what my roles were and my kids and schedules and then trying to be something else. So I appreciate your honesty in that because I have been there too. And, and I hope I'm a whole lot less there now. Um, I, but you know, when we think that we're above it all, probably better recheck again because yeah. that that's a tricky one, man. You know, it is, but you know, you've built a, you've built a name for yourself and a brand that everyone that I, I talk to again, I feel like they know you and everyone has great things to say about you. Um, and the few times that we've actually interacted, you know, I, you're very transparent and I think you're very, not only a genuine and authentic leader, but a genuine authentic person. And we all have our short, shortfalls, you know, none of us are going to be perfect. So no. I, uh, I thank you for your time today and what you're doing in the community. And I love your podcast, <laughs> anything but typical. Um, it, that's right. Is it anything but yeah, typical? Yeah, it's anything okay. but typical. But so, yeah, it's, it's great. So I'll put I that in give, the show notes so people thank you. can check it out. I, I want to give a shout out to the guy who came to me with that idea, at least to do the podcast, is Ben McDonald. He's my co-host and he's really the... He's, he's the guy that started it. He started his own podcast before. He's had tremendous success as an entrepreneur, much, much more than I ever did. Um, but he came to me with this idea and said, man, I would love to co-host something with you. And I said, oh, man, I'd love to do that because I want to learn from you. But I said, here's the thing. I want to call it anything but typical. He's like, ooh, I like that. Why? And I said, because I think every one of us is anything but typical look at we all have a unique thumbprint everyone has a unique thumbprint and um i want to really focus on entrepreneurs if possible because they risk many it's not because they're they're more important than anybody else but they are ripple makers whether they're good ripples or bad ripples mm -hmm. um and i've been both quite frankly um and i i just want to be I want to focus and I want to encourage people that are positive ripple makers and I want others to be inspired by, by their stories. So, you know, if you haven't listened to it, go back and listen to uh, Stacy Cassio and Chris Elmore. I know that you've, you've listened to it or you're most halfway the way through. through. Yeah. Halfway through it. So thanks for having me on Brittany. Yeah, um, thank you. Reaching out to me and hopefully this will um, bless somebody out there.